Okay, the recording is running. Um, if you have any questions or comments at any point, please feel free to put those in the chat. I will keep an eye on the chat, Amy, so that you don't have to do that. Um, and I will let you know if any uh, burning questions come up. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Well, I'll say first that I'm not totally sure how long, how much content I actually have. So I hope that people have questions um, because I wanted to make sure that this was really addressing the things they all wanted to know about the most. Um, so can you all see that? Can you see my slide? Yes. Okay, awesome, thank you. So this is called Crafting the Mac. Um, I just feel like I should say this, um, and I realize this is not gonna be written in any book or anything like that, but I totally came up with the name for the Mac. Um, so I just wanted y'all to know that, thank you. Okay, so the first question is, why is Amy talking to us about this? And I mean that, like, why is Amy talking to us about this, not why is Amy talking to us about this? This is important, but so kind of like Jenny said, um, I have also been involved with, well, I've been on the General Education Council forever. I probably should have looked it up to see when I started, but it's been a really long time. I can tell you that. Um, I So the General Education Council is the um, Faculty Senate Committee that uh, certifies classes to be part of the general education program. They look at courses to see if, um, you know, they should be included in the program. Um, goes along with, you know, things like the, the undergraduate curriculum committee is they approve all classes, um, but the classes that are going to be part of the general education program have an extra step in which they go to the general education council to make sure that they are um, fitting in with the objectives that the general education has set out, general education council has set out as important to um, the program. So in addition to that, I'm actually serving as of, I guess, Monday of next week as the chair of the Gen Ed Council this year, which I'll talk a little bit more about why that's really important and why this is a very important time to be <laughs> Uh, chair of the General Education Council. Um, but like Jenny, I served on the General Education Revision Task Force, the, the second. Jenny was on the first one. She and I both were on the second one. Um, well, so actually, I, I co chaired the second one with um, Jody oh, Pettizzoni oh, from oh, the Office of assessment, I should really know Jody's title by this point, Office of Assessment and Accreditation. Um, so we actually put together the plan that ended up being passed and is now what we call the MAC. So that's why me. Um, I've been pretty involved and continue to be involved in this thing. There we go. All right. So the first thing I want to talk to you a little bit about is competency-based education. Does anybody know what that means or think they know what it means? You can either type what you think it is in the chat or you can unmute and tell us. What do you think that means? Oh yeah, Leah Jody is awesome, by the way. Okay, so contrasted with skills. Okay, education toward the development of specific skills, core set of knowledge. Oh, these are all really good things. Oh, these are good. Okay, yes, yeah. So pretty much what Leah and Sean said. Um, so technically there's a lot more to it than that, but so we'll talk a little bit more about that, but that's basically the real actual competency-based education is, um, there's this place, this college called Western Governors University. I don't know if you've ever heard commercials for them on the radio. That's normally how you know that a school is a good place to go is if there are radio commercials for them. Um, but they, basically you can take, you can test out of classes if you know stuff already. Okay, so competency-based education takes prior learning into account and is based on the mastery of knowledge or skills. Um, so we talk a lot about competencies in the MAC program, but MAC is not technically competency-based education yet. Um, 
in the plan. So we're doing, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but we're doing a phased rollout. So what we call phase 17, which it's not really phase 17 in the future, eventually we will have some sort of way for students to prove that they are competent in a particular thing. And that would mean that they would be able to um, to not take specific classes. So as the example that we use typically um, is if someone had worked in an accounting firm for 20 years and never got a college degree when they came to college, they wouldn't have to take a math class because they already know how to do math. I mean, they would have to prove it in some way. Um, but the logical conclusion to competency-based education is that eventually, if you already have the competency, you wouldn't have to take the class in college. So keep that in mind. Um, but also when we talk about what competency means to us at UNCG, it's the set of knowledge or skills that we think are important for UNCG students to have. So that's my next question to you. What are skills or knowledge that you think that students should have when they graduate from college? Like, you know, you don't have to type like student learning outcomes, but what are some things that you think students should graduate from college with knowledge of? Is that a weirdly stated question? Critical thinking. Wow, John's good at this game. Writing, yes. So while y'all are typing, I will say, so Sean and Juanita, so Juanita, yes, they can still test. There are still placement tests. You know, students can still place into Spanish four or whatever. Um, that is still a thing, but like they can't just, there's they can't test out of a competency yet. I guess is what I'm saying. So like Sean, if somebody comes in with AP credit, they still come in with AP credit. Um, and if their AP class lines up with a UNCG class that's in the competency, it counts. So if somebody takes um, the AP calculus exam and gets a five on it, they place out of calculus one, I think. So yes, yeah, so that stuff is still the same. All right, so we've got critical thinking, writing skills, knowing another language, speaking skills, cultural competency, research process. Okay, so those are all great and pretty much all of them with the exception of knowing another language, which we'll talk about, um, are included. So yay, y'all were right, good job. So now we're gonna talk about the Mac. And yes, that is a giant wheel of cheese. I hope you're sensing the theme at this point. Um, so the Mac stands for Minerva's Academic Curriculum. And I will be really honest, that's sort of a backronym. Um, we got a request from advisors <laughs> to have an acronym that um, people could say easily. And so we had, we were trying to think of an, an acronym and we had Minerva and it just sort of became MAC. And sorry, if you don't know what a backronym is, a backronym is an acronym where you have the letters first and then you make up the words to go along with it. So anyway, so that's where the MAC came from. Um, we're really trying to figure out how to get cheese more involved, but stay tuned. So at UNCG, the MAC requirement is that students have to take one class in each of these 11 competencies. Um, just so you know, for space, um, the so I, I had to shorten a little bit just to warn you that that's what we did. So the CTI is critical thinking and inquiry. Um, so six is critical thinking and inquiry in the humanities and fine arts. Seven is critical thinking and inquiry in social and behavioral sciences. And eight is critical thinking and inquiry in the natural sciences. Okay, sorry, all my words wouldn't fit um, with a beautiful picture of macaroni and cheese. So I made a decision and 
I hope that you're all okay with it. So basically to complete the MAC program, they take one class in each of these competencies. Um, if you do that math, that is a total of 33 or 34 hours. And I can explain the 34 hours. Um, these are all three credit classes with the exception of the last one. So the data analysis and interpretation, that is normally a three credit class and a one credit lab. So, um, you know, it'd be like, I don't think bio 105 is in that category, but if it was like you take bio 105 and bio 105 lab, then that meets the data analysis competency. So yeah, so one question that you may be asking yourselves is, where's information literacy? That's clearly the most important thing that students need to know. And the answer is, it's actually in two places. It lives in foundations and it also lives in health and wellness, which I'll explain, it makes sense. So a lot of these things, if you're at all familiar with the current general education program, a lot of these things sort of map over from there. Um, you know, quantitative reasoning, that's math. We have math in the current program. We have math in the new program. Um, but this is actually, again, I don't know how familiar y'all are with the current program, but this is way less complicated than what we had before. Um, it was, there were markers, there were, um, it was just, it, it was, if you ask somebody how many hours our current, our former general education program was, they couldn't actually tell you. This one, 33 to 34 hours, it's very straightforward. Um, so yeah, so that's what we have going here. So just to give you a little bit more information about the CTIs, the critical thinking and inquiry, one of the requirements from um, SACS, SACS is our accrediting body, SACS COC, is that we offer breadth in our um, general education program. They don't have a lot of requirements, but one of them is what they call the breadth requirement. So um, basically they don't want students to take all 11, you know, all, that whole general education program from one discipline. So the um, critical thinking and inquiry classes are sort of our way to make sure that students are taking a humanities and fine arts, a social and behavioral science and a natural science. Part of the reason that we went this route and that these are sort of broad is that we wanted the whole campus to feel like they could be a part of it. Um, and one thing that I didn't do that I should do if we have time is I'll pull up some of the classes that have been approved um, under the new Gen Ed program and they sound really awesome. So I'm really excited um, that people have kind of taken this and, and run with it. I mean, one of the things that we wanted to do was we wanted to say um, written communication can totally be taught by the English department, but other people know how to do writing too. Um, you know, global engagement, that's probably language classes, but you know what? Other departments do global stuff too. So they can be part of the part of the party as well. Um, so, you know, we try to make it so that students could kind of get these competencies in interesting places. So we'll talk more about that. Oh, sorry, I keep forgetting how to advance my slides. There we go. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little, well, actually, hold on, let me go back. There we go. So what, do y'all have questions so far about this stuff? Sam, it is a billion percent easier. It just, it is, it's so much easier. What, Amy can ask one question. We talk yeah, about totally. AP exams and things. Can AP exams or any other credits supplement these requirements or do these requirements have to be taken at USCG classes? Like nope. if I have an AP history, is that critical thinking in humanities? It, it is, yeah. Um, and it depends on, like we have a chart. <laughs> there are charts for everything. So yes, 
depending on what the AP class is, like if you take AP psychology, that's going to come in as your critical thinking and inquiry and social and behavioral. So yes, yep. So that that still happens. So things can, can still transfer in as these competencies. Same for community college transfers. Um, if students take English 101 at the community college, that comes in as their written communication. So yes, so yeah, all that stuff is still in place. Um, and actually it's interesting because in the former program, we didn't have health and wellness, you might have known that, um, but our community college students came in with health and wellness credits. So before those credits just kind of became elective credits and now they're actually useful. Um, and also when we were you know, coming up with this plan, we did a lot of research and talked to a lot of people um, and health and wellness was a competency that students really wanted. Um, it created some interesting discussions because I think that that faculty have a lot of ideas about what general education should be. Um, you know, there were definitely people who wanted there to be, I mean, this is, I'm going to be overly obtuse here and say like, you know, everybody should learn Latin and, you know, read Plato and, you know, that sort of stuff, which is important. And students can choose to do that here. But um, health and wellness was seen by some as like PE class. It's not PE class. Like you can't actually take a PE class um, for health and wellness because it has to be three credits. Um, there are PE classes. Well, there are classes with physical components that are in the health and wellness competency, but you also have to learn stuff. So um, that was a, a callback that we had many times. It's like, I'm just gonna learn to play basketball and that's gonna be my health and wellness credit. Um, it's, not, it's not what we're doing here. There is actual academic learning involved and actually information literacy. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Okay. So when you take a class at GTEC um, and it transfers in, do you get the attributes? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. So this this all works with the articulation agreement that we have with um, every community college in North Carolina. So yeah. So the classes that you take in um, at GTCC transfer over as MAC requirements. Yep. Okay. But so like, I know when you take an AP class, you don't get the attributes when they transfer in, you just get straight up credit, but you don't get like the markers or the attributes. So, yes, I think that's, yeah, I think that's right. But <laughs> if you take the class at GTEC, would you get those markers and attributes when they transfer? Yes, yeah, yeah, there's a, yes, um, we're still, working on mapping everything to the articulation agreement, but yes, yep. They... So that would be a benefit to taking a class at GTEC versus taking it as an AP. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Uh-huh. All right. Anything else? And we can ask, you can ask questions later. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about... <laughs> Yes, RIP swim test. Um, so markers and attributes and are actually, they're terms that are Anne Simons, not Anne Purdue, who knows what they are because she asked about them. So those are terms that we use with the current plan. Um, well, the soon to be former plan, the general education plan, because there were like classes that you had to take, and then there were sort of markers layered on top of them. Um, we've all tried to strike the word marker from our, um, our vocabularies because it's not, it's so complicated. But yeah, so basically you just have to fill in the list. Like we're, we're yeah, they're just, they're, uh, they're just competencies. And um, that's, how we're referring to them now. So that's confusing, but yeah. So markers and attributes are part of the current plan. Now we're just calling them competencies. Um, yeah, okay. So now we're gonna talk about the rollout, try to find a wheel of cheese. This was the best I could do. It's a lot of cheese though. 
So this turnaround has been really fast. Like this program was voted on by Faculty Senate in October of 2019. And so we basically have had um, a year and a half to run an entire, to start up an entire program, much of which, well, almost two years, but still much of which was done during, I don't know, a little thing that we like to call COVID-19, um, which made everything very difficult. So basically we had to approve new classes, decide which old classes were gonna be, you know, put in the new program, all this other stuff. So what we have been doing is what we call a phase rollout. So starting this fall, new students will start taking Mac classes. So just to show you, I'm gonna switch gears for just a minute, hold on. Um, Sorry, I'm trying to Google and talk at the same time, which is not a good plan. All right, let me grab. And actually, I was just dealing with a question about this today, so it's fresh on my mind. All right, I'm going to stop sharing for just a second. And then I'm going to reshare. Sorry for the, here we go. Okay, so this is Jeannie, and these are classes for, do you see my Jeannie screen? Do y'all see that? Yes. Okay, cool, thanks. So over here on the side, you can see that there are a lot of options. Um, this is Religious Studies 101, um, which currently has a GPR. <laughs> and a GL. So that is things from the old general education plan, because the thing to keep in mind is that we're starting this new plan this fall, but that is only for new students, okay? So people who set foot on campus this fall for the first time, they are taking MAC classes. So we actually have a lot of classes that are currently both. So you can see that this class is, but you know, has this um, this marker, the GL, and then the GPR attribute, but it's also a MAC critical thinking in humanities and fine arts. So just to show you, so then, you know, there's other ones like this one is just a diversity and equity class. So this is a new class um, that's, you know, going to be taught for the first time this fall that is going to be for students to meet this diversity and equ equity competency. But Again, there are these, there are a bunch of classes that do double duty for right now, um, because we, technically we're running two programs until all the students who are on the old gen ed program graduate. So actually, I can't remember what department it is, but sometimes you'll even see um, things in Genie that say Aller, <laughs> and that's the gen ed program before our current gen ed program. So that's like two programs ago for in case somebody came here in the 90s and then comes back, we have to figure out what to do with them. It's a mess, y'all. This is, it's a bureaucratic nightmare. Um, so you can see that a lot of these classes are sort of doing the old and the new at the same time. Um, but actually I sort of picked religious studies. I should have picked, uh, Hold on, let me try this again. Philosophy, because they have the cool stuff, I think, in my opinion. So philosophy is doing a lot of very interesting things. Um, they, of course, are doing critical thinking in humanities and fine arts, um, but they're also doing a bunch of foundations classes. So foundations classes are new. Um, I mean, we've always had sort of university acculturation classes, uh, but this is the first time they're going to be required. So students can take a class like FYU 101, you know, kind of get to know UNCG, or they can take philosophy of education, which is a foundations class, or minds and brains, which is a foundations class. Um, so there's, you know, there's a lot of cool stuff like that and see they're also doing, you know, philosophy of race and gender is a diversity and equity class. Um, I'm trying to remember where their health and wellness one is. They have a health and wellness one as well, but I can't remember what it is like 
So there's a lot of really interesting classes that are being taught that hadn't been taught before. I can't remember if they did sex, drugs, and rock and roll, or if that was, um, it might have been religious studies. But anyway, so, um, so these, you know, we kind of had these two programs running at the same time. And, you know, students will be taking classes to meet one or the other. It's, it's confusing, but it's fine. All the information you need is right there in Genie. So, sorry, I'm gonna reshare again. There we go. Um, so students who are here already at UNCG can switch to the MAC program or they can stay on the current program. And advisors have had a lot of training. We actually have a, um, a program that allows them to sort of do like an analysis to see which one they're closer to finishing. Um, so if they find out that they, you know, should stay on the old one, then they just stay on the old one. Um, or, you know, maybe they've only taken a couple classes in general education and maybe they decide to switch to Mac. Um, so that's going to be, we're, we're have, we are offering a lot of flexibility this year as we're sort of switching from one to the other. We are still adding classes. Um, I mean, not for this fall, but the General Education Council will be working um, through the fall semester to get additional MAC classes um, scheduled for spring and also, you know, next fall um, to make sure that we have enough seats for them. So yes, um, Terry, new students does include transfer students. So new transfer students will be on the MAC program, but their stuff will map over from wherever they are transferring from. Um, that is, as I'm learning, more complicated than it sounds because we have this um, articulation agreement from community colleges. Sorry, but um, like we have students who transfer from other UNC system schools. And so basically there's like a database of classes, you know, like this class at UNC Wilmington translates to this thing. And basically we're gonna have to rebuild all of that from scratch. So as these students come in, somebody actually has to go in and look at their classes, see what Mac, Mac categories they match to, and um, then add that to the database. So when that next student from UNC Wilmington comes in with that class, we know what to do with it. So it's very complicated. It's gonna be my life this fall, spring, forever. I don't know. Um, so then, um, fall 2022, I think, is where the really interesting stuff starts to happen. Um, one thing that we were very clear on when we were coming up with um, this MAC program was that the MAC program is designed to be foundational. So students would get sort of introductory skills in these areas but they're not necessarily gonna be competent yet. Like, I don't know, many of us probably took one quantitative reasoning class in college. Are we competent in math? I don't know. Um, so one thing that is the next phase is all of the majors and programs on campus will come up with plans for how they are teaching the competencies in the majors. So for example, um, if you are an education major, I'm just gonna pick say elementary education major, the um, elementary education program is going to have to say, you know, here's where we're teaching quantitative reasoning. It's probably in like math for elementary majors. Um, here is where we're teaching um, diversity and equity, hopefully in all the classes, and the, they are teaching it in all the classes in the elementary ed major, like, trust me, they are, um, you know, where are we teaching um, critical and critical thinking and inquiry? So basically, departments will have to map these requirements to their curriculum. 
So with that, you know, you sort of have the, the theory is what we're aiming for is students get this sort of baseline. Every UNCG student gets this sort of baseline of knowledge in these 11 competencies, and then they get the discipline specific stuff when they get into their majors. So, you know, what is diversity and equity like in, you know, elementary ed versus Spanish or, you know, what does critical thinking look like in biology versus consumer apparel and retail studies. There we go. So, um, so yeah, so it sort of, it carries on from the baseline into the majors, which I think is really cool um, because we have decided as a campus that these are the things that are important to us. And so, you know, we want to make sure that students are getting it throughout their time at UNCG, not just one three hour, three credit hour class they take with their freshmen. The other thing that I'm excited about, and I'm really hopeful this is going to happen, is something we call thematic clusters. So thematic clusters will be like a, a program where students can take multiple MAC classes that have sort of the same theme. So let's see. I mean, it could be like um, North Carolina could be a theme. And maybe you could take like a foundations class. It's like introduction to North Carolina. And then you could take your natural, your CTI natural science is like the plants of North Carolina. And um, maybe your diversity and equity class would be like the history of civil rights in North Carolina or something like that. So the idea is that students are cohorted into these this cluster of classes where they can, you know, kind of develop community and also learn about things that are interesting to them. So I think this is really cool. A lot of places have done really cool things with thematic clusters. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that we can get some interesting things. It's kind of like for those of you who have been around for long enough, when we went through that living learning community thing, which was great and which I, I am on board with, but you know, we went through that phase where we're trying to get folks to do living learning communities because it's good for retention and because it builds community and all those other things. Um, it's sort of like that, except without the living part. It's just the, you know, students take these classes together and, you know, hopefully the instructors are talking to each other and maybe they're doing assignments that kind of work together. Um, so we'll see. I'm, I'm hopeful that this is going to get some traction and um, I don't know. We'll find out. So just take a moment to imagine what your dream thematic cluster would be. What would be a topic that you would love to take a couple of classes on? Imagine that you're in college. What would that look like? What would your dream cluster be? Yeah, it's sort of like magnet school, Sean. You're right. You get one theme, you pick a thing that you're interested in, and yeah, you can take a couple classes on it. Anybody have a, a dream cluster? Oh, that'd be fun. Feminist musicals. Oh, that would be great. You could do a writing class on that. You could do obviously your humanities and fine arts on that. That would be really cool, Sarah. I think that'd be awesome. No, I don't think that environment and the outdoors would be too broad. I think that could fit into all sorts of areas. I think that would be really cool. Um, I would vote for TV and movies also. Um, Sean, you could do all kinds of stuff, right? You could do writing. You could do like criticism. Um, there's all kinds of cool stuff that you could do. Yeah, no, I think that would be really cool. Also, the thing I like about the foundations class is that there's some there's a lot of wiggle room in there. Um, so you could, um, you know, you could take like a, a foundations class that the theme was reality TV or whatever. And then you could, um, you know, just learn about TV sort of in the, in the, like, and learn about all the UNCG stuff too. So that'd be really cool. I love that idea. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of cool possibilities. And like I said, I'm really hoping 
that some faculty get really into it. Um, it's been interesting to see folks get into um, some of the competencies. So I'm hopeful that they'll get into that as well. This is the point at which I ran out of mac and cheese pictures. So we switched gears a little bit to um, it's like marinara sauce. Not everybody likes cheese. I don't know who they are. Well, not everybody likes cheese. Okay, so now it's time to talk about Mac and the libraries. And this is really the picture that makes me hungry. Apologies in advance to vegetarians. Sorry, Jenny. Um, yeah, no, that's true. And that's why it's just Mac. It's not cheese. Not everybody likes cheese. All right, so what does this mean for us? What a great question, Amy. I'm glad you asked it to yourself. So currently here, I'm gonna switch screen shares again. Oop, sorry, having trouble over here. Ugh, I just closed my window. Um, not cooperating. There we go. Okay, sorry. Thank you for coming, Sam. I know you're, you're into this. I appreciate you coming anyway. Um, okay, so this is the Mac website. Can you see the Mac website? Sorry, I keep asking. Yes. Okay, thank you, Jenny. Um, it's, I'll, I'll share the slides at the end. It's mac.umncg.edu. So what you can see here on this page, I'm gonna be honest and say, there's, it's not complete. There's some information that needs to be added to this page. So as I mentioned before, um, information literacy is explicitly a part of the foundation's competency. So you can see here, um, the first couple of student learning outcomes are related to kind of UNCG stuff, acclimation, getting used to UNCG, like, you know, how to set goals and build connections and all those sorts of things. All very important things, obviously things that we felt were important enough to be part of this program. But then the last two student learning outcomes, thanks in large part to Jenny Dale, are information literacy SLOs. So every student who takes a foundations class will learn to critically evaluate information and media sources in a variety of formats and also incorporate and cite sources accurately and correctly. So um, as you can see, that's very, um, those are information literacy things. So that's one place for sure that information literacy lives. The other place is actually in health and wellness. Um, as you can see here, the first two are related to health and wellness. And the last two are about synthesizing information to support arguments and or inform decisions, and then integrate insight sources correctly and accurately. See that that pops up again, because I think anybody who's ever been a student or worked with a student will know that integrating and citing sources is a growth area for many students, many college students. Um, also, it's really interesting when I when I sort of reflect back on this whole process, when we, you know, started developing this program in 2019, we really thought that, wow, health and wellness would actually make a lot of sense as a place to put information literacy skills, because health information literacy is important, and it's important for people to understand how to find health information. Like that's one of those things that people are going to be, you know, using for the rest of their lives. But boy, I'm just going to say, pat on the back to members of the general education revision task force. We had no idea how important it was going to be, right? I mean, to me, everything that's happened in the last 16 months has shown how important health information literacy is. Um, so I am actually I don't know, very happy, ecstatic, I don't know, that we included information literacy in the health and wellness outcomes, because I do think that this is incredibly important. Um, so I feel really good about that. I just have to say that. Pat self on back and pats everyone else on the back from an appropriate distance, of course. So um, 
as far as sorry resharing again um so you know those are classes that we will likely have you know relationships with you know we may go meet with them we will have you know lip guides and maybe tutorials and things like that um that you know will go into these classes and you know so that we can help make sure that students are gaining these skills in these classes like you know like they should be but one thing that we found that's been really interesting is that some of the classes that don't necessarily have information literacy outcomes explicitly they still want to work with us because we're fantastic so in addition to sort of saying okay well the library hopefully is going to have a place in foundations and health and wellness you know we're going to be we're going to be other places as well so you know i think it's going to be really possible that we'll still show up in a lot of critical thinking and inquiry classes because of course information literacy and critical thinking are very closely related um so you know we don't know yet beyond sort of foundations and health and wellness how this is going to sort of affect the the workload of people who are involved in information literacy instruction um but by golly i'm excited to find out so it's going to be interesting though to see um to see how our our work changes um as the mac is implemented more fully and of course again um the thing to keep in mind is that for you know next year with that sort of upper level competency integration they're going to have to departments are going to have to prove that they're integrating information literacy into their upper level classes as well so good luck to all of us okay so that's all of my stuff that i wanted to show you and again i will share my link to my slides um one thing that i will point out is the final report from the task force I actually haven't looked at it in a while, but I realized earlier today that I really needed to because we've been stuck in the weeds for a long time trying to get this thing actually going and I need to sort of reframe myself and go back and see what we meant to happen when this all started. Um, but let me stop sharing and then I will share a link to my slides. Nope. Um, oh, wait, hold on. I got to say this real quick because part of using slides carnival is thank you to all the wonderful people who made and released these awesome resources for free slides carnival unsplash thank you okay so whew, i talked a lot what questions do you have what what do you wish i had talked about First off, thank you so much, Amy. Really appreciate it. Um, and this is a great time. So there were some times when the chat was going pretty quickly. So it's possible that um, I missed a question or that Amy missed a question when speaking. Um, so if you have questions that didn't get answered or questions we haven't asked yet, please feel free to ask those now. We still have some time. Yes, and I should say also that during the spring, um so one of the one of the plans and if you've been around long enough you might have heard of this model they had faculty fellows in sort of the new competencies so foundations health and wellness and diversity and equity um and not trying to brag but two of those three were our own jenny dale and sam harlow jenny was the faculty fellow for foundations and sam was the faculty fellow for health and wellness which was beautiful because information literacy is a part of both of those um so i think that was really important to kind of you know i felt like in, in my very biased opinion that they were the most knowledgeable people to take on that role and so i'm really glad that they did go team so yeah so there's been a lot happening <laughs> behind the scenes in order to just this flawless rollout um so but yeah, we have been heavily involved and will continue to be so. Amy, have you gotten any feedback or a lot of responses from students or faculty knowing, you know, this change was coming? 
Oh, yes. Yeah, you know, UNCG, I'm not shocked by things, but just curious. <laughs> like, I don't know a lot about how the past was, but I'm from general consensus, it seems like this is better. So I don't know if you heard a lot. I, I think from what, so one of the most terrifying things that I've ever done in my life was I presented on this um, with the wonderful Jody Petazzoni and Dana Dunn was there also when she was the provost at a student government association meeting and it was terrifying like they are it, that is an intense group of people they're all dressed up and they use very strict parliamentary procedure and they're they're just like fantastic like they're just yeah, they kind of blow your mind when they're all in the room together. Um, but when we presented on this, it was actually shortly before it was approved by Senate. They were they all gave us excellent feedback on the simplicity <laughs> of completing the program and also um, on sort of what what was included and what what we were saying was important. So in that realm, we got real. You know, we got extremely positive feedback um so that was really nice like i said there have been you know faculty have opinions um and there you know people have been really excited like i said some of the departments like religious studies and philosophy have really kind of taken this and run with it and be like cool we can do you know an english department they're doing a like um sport and literature class and so there are people who have gotten really creative with sort of how they can meet these learning outcomes in kind of an unconventional way so that's really cool and i'm really excited about the people that have gotten excited about it that sounded weird but you know what i mean so um i mean it's going to be really interesting to see what happens kind of in the fall when the rubber meets the road but i'm i'm hopeful that most people will be happy about it <laughs> I mean, the good news is for the students who are starting this fall, like they don't know any different, um, but hopefully they'll just think that it's the greatest thing ever. So I don't know. We'll see. Yes. And Jenny, so I totally agree, Jenny. They are like, I think that maybe they all have read Robert's Rules of Order, which I've never done. I don't know anybody who has done it. Any other? questions or thoughts or anything? I bet Dr. James has to. She probably sleeps with it under her pillow at night, but she's probably the only person who <laughs> has read it. Yes, okay. Dr. Wells too, but all right. Well, if y'all ever have questions or anything that you want to talk about, um or anything that comes up please let me know like i said i spend a lot of time on mac um between being the gen ed council chair and also um i serve on the implementation committee which i didn't even talk about because that's more stuff to talk about um but if you ever have questions please let me know um and maybe like maybe in the spring jenny i can do a session kind of updating us on how things are going. I think that sounds great. And I will just wrap up by once again, thank you so much, Amy. Um, and I'm sure you will be hearing from many of us as we have questions. As Amy mentioned, both Sam and I have also been involved in specific parts of the implementation process. So please do feel free to contact us as well. And with that, it's getting really kind of overcast here. I'm wondering if there's a storm coming. So I'm going to go be um, be on chat and, and kind of keep an eye on the world outside and see what's up. All right, friends, thank you so much. And thank you particularly to Amy. And uh, please keep an eye out for this recording to be up on the ULVLC LibGuide. And keep an eye out for an email from me later this week about what's coming up. Bye. Bye, y'all.